Charles and Diana visited the White House in November 1985. The couple were guests of President Ronald Reagan and his wife Nancy. Diana wore the sapphire choker with a midnight blue velvet gown designed by Victor Edelstein. President Reagan recalled the evening in an interview. We had uh, invited for that particular dinner at the White House uh, a group of people who uh, themselves were stars in whatever their activity was, very prominent and well-known people. I'd had an opportunity at, at dinner to uh, hear of what she thought about some of particularly the performing stars that were there. So the dancing began, but yet uh, she was the center of attention. The, the rest of the people were pretty much of a, an audience. So I managed to get word to John Travolta. She had uh, mentioned approvingly during, uh, during dinner to ask her to dance. He did, and uh, they danced beautifully together, and it was, uh, uh, it was a kind of high spot that I do remember in that entire evening. A year later, in 1986, the royal couple made a tour of the Gulf states. In the male-dominated society of Saudi Arabia, even a princess was expected to take second place to her husband. King Fahd was a great admirer of the British monarchy. This was the man who had given Diana the wonderful sapphire and diamond suite as a wedding present. To meet the king in Riyadh, Diana wore a long black and white duchess gown by Elizabeth and David Emmanuel, tied at the hip with a large striped bow. The lover's knot tiara signified her royal duty as an ambassador for Britain. However, she was painfully thin, hiding an eating disorder, and her marriage was in severe difficulties. Diana, then just 25, had to keep up the appearance of a devoted royal wife. In Qatar, it was Charles who received jewels. He was awarded the Golden Qatar Order of Merit. The tour moved on to Oman, where the couple visited the Sultan in his palace. His austere appearance suggested a man of traditional tastes, but here was a host who really knew how to please his guests. To Prince Charles, he gave a new 80,000-pound Aston Martin car. Diana received a suite of remarkable jewels. At first, Buckingham Palace denied they had received these extravagant gifts. Lavish presents, though, from wealthy rulers are not new to members of the royal family who are accustomed to receiving them. In 1911, King George V and Queen Mary were crowned Emperor and Empress of India, and at the Delhi Durbar, Queen Mary was showered with priceless jewels from the Indian Maharajas, which still adorn members of the royal family today. There's nothing really new about being swamped with jewels, because the, uh, the Queen herself, when she got married, and remember she wasn't Queen at that point, she also had an enormous amount of jewellery given to her. And it's always the case that people who have their own stock of jewellery can do it. It's different if we're talking about a state gift, because that has to be decided upon. But the coffers of the royal family were enormously enlarged in Queen Victoria's era and reign because of the jewels from the Maharajas, who, like the Middle Eastern potentates today, are entirely in control of the situation. Diana was delighted with her very valuable gift from the Sultan of Oman. The style suggested the crescent moon symbol of Islamic faith, but the setting of the necklace, bracelet and earrings was strikingly modern. The people who were most able to give jewels to Diana at that particular point were the Gulf states, where they've got these absolute rulers. If they want to go and order jewels or give their own jewels or take something from their own treasury and give it to Princess Diana or anyone else, they are free to do so. A year later, during a tour of Germany, Diana unveiled her priceless Omani jewels. She wore the velvet dress in which she danced at the White House. A Spencer tiara was held in place by her upswept hair. With their marriage under strain, the royal couple were flying the flag for Britain. She wore her jewels to send the message out to Charles and to everyone who, who saw her. Um, to say how confident she was in her new life, 
how she felt in her own skin, and she really used the power of jewels to make a statement about her, her ideals, her beliefs, her values, and of course her personal style. The Saudi sapphires, so much admired in previous Australian visits, were worn once more to great effect. Dancing with Charles in Melbourne, Diana created a sensation. With her hair worn up, her bare neck and low-cut gown emphasized the magnificent Saudi gems. Who would have guessed that this royal couple, seemingly in step with each other, lived almost separate lives? In 1991, Diana made a solo tour of Pakistan. She had grown adept at sending out unspoken signals of loneliness. Knowing that earrings draw attention to the face, she chose her largest pair, the wedding gift from the Amir of Qatar. She had worn the ornate diamond and pearl drop earrings many times. Diana owned another pair of pearl earrings, a wedding gift from the Spencer family jeweler, Collingwood. She wore these with her lover's knot tiara. And with the King Faisal diamond necklace loaned by the Queen. When she developed her own style, when she became much more confident, um, she took to wearing bigger clip-on button earrings, which was a you know very different look, perhaps a, a little bit a little bit stronger, a little bit less romantic. Um, but she understood that earrings can light up the face immediately, especially. Um, together with a, with a choker and a necklace. That was her hallmark. In 1993, after her separation from Charles, Diana attended an English National Ballet performance at Her Majesty's Theatre in London. But Diana's life, half in and half out of the royal family, was fraught with difficulties. At this stage, she was trying to work out the delicate balance needed in her new life. She underlined her still royal status by wearing multi-strands of pearls around her neck, in a style reminiscent of Queen Alexandra, herself a former Princess of Wales. What I think was very interesting was that she echoed the style of Princess Alexandra, who was one, of course, the most elegant Princess of Wales in, in, in our history. Um, and I think that was, it was very beautiful, it was very elegant of her to do that, and of course, very, very romantic. In the early 90s, Diana's love for pearl chokers, inherited from the Spencer family, created a new fashion trend. She almost started single-handedly what I call the new romantic craze, and that pearl choker became a badge, a symbol of, this, of the new romantic look, all her pie-crust collars, the wonderful frills that she wore. Um, the pearls really played into that extremely, extremely well. In 1995, at the National Gallery, Diana met the model Twiggy. She combined a set of simple pearl earrings with a choker, with layers of tiny pearls worn high on the neck. The pearls set off her complexion. I mean, she was such a beautiful girl with such wonderful glowing skin, and the pearls emphasized her, her beauty. Um, they were quite shy and coy, and again, of course, they suited her as, as she was at, at the time. Um, and they just started, a, you know, they launched a million pearl chokers. They kicked off the most huge craze for pearl chokers. In her private life with her sons, she was just a single mother. Her casual attire required no formal jewels. For her charity work, she often dressed like a businesswoman in a smart suit with minimal decoration. A regular part of Diana's day involved shopping in Chelsea, the fashionable district of London. One of her favourite stores was Butler & Wilson, a costume jewellery shop. We know that she was very fond of rummaging around and um, finding a fun piece of jewellery. She appeared in a tuxedo looking stunning wearing the uh, Butler & Wilson uh, serpent on her, on her lapel. She even dared to wear uh, a jeweled order, a star. She wore it right in the centre. 
Diana mingled easily with other shoppers who were unaware that a princess was shopping next to them. Very easy with the staff, always had a great sense of humour and enjoyed shopping. So we've seen a lot of very famous people and they never, they're always a foot smaller or they're not as beautiful as what you imagine. With her she was the reverse, she was a foot taller than what you imagined. She, she actually glowed so she had wonderful piercing blue eyes and she was extraordinary, so whatever she was wearing and thing, it always enhanced it. She always bought very classic things too, that, she would, that you would see her wearing all the time. She bought a little pair of earrings, that were French glass earrings, black French glass earrings. She wore them all the time, they were five pounds. So it wasn't intrinsic things, it was because it went, she wore things because it actually fitted with what she was wearing. Another famous pair of earrings that she wore all the time were silver gold earrings, just a plain gold. So she accessorized herself. She was so she would try things from the very simple to the very exciting things. A big star necklace or a wonderful star pinned on the back of her hair. She was so much part of the 80s style and it was at that time that costume jewellery was really booming. She was a young girl, she loved the fun, she loved the wit and whimsy of costume jewellery and she really indulged and I think she had a bit of fun. You know, she liked to, um, to mix the very grand royal jewels with uh, a piece of costume jewellery from Butler and Wilson. Diamond earrings were clever fakes. Sapphires were false. These earrings were costume jewellery. It was often hard to tell genuine gems from fun fakes. The false jewels almost became a metaphor, suggesting the double life Diana was leading behind the scenes.